I see this map being for the city of Paris. I see the other car getting unlocked. I see me applying for a visa to attend her graduation. Cafes opening across the country, perhaps even overseas. I see a five star resort with guests from all over the world enjoying this view. I see her becoming an award winning singer one day. I see me retiring early and traveling the world. Your dream, our goal. Nations Trust Bank, working today for your future. Don't make a first impression or lasting impression without it. Don't trade law school for life school without it. Don't turn your house into a home without it. Don't share a moment while sharing a moment without it. Don't go abroad, go live, or go just a little out of your comfort zone without it. Don't change the game, or even change the world without it. And don't watch your dance like nobody's watching without it. Whatever you do, don't forget that the more you live forward, the more you need someone at your back. The powerful backing of American Express. Don't live life without it. Um, I, I'm going to do the shorter version because uh, we've given Sampath, you know, uh, we gave him a long, I remember the first time when I spoke about Sampath and, you know, I was reading a long bio and I was amazed at this young, you know, extremely talented, obviously extremely qualified Professor, who I think Sri Lanka is fortunate to have, right? Uh, we have a dearth of talent in this country, and all the best talent is running away. And you have someone who's picked up, you know, multiple qualifications, well versed, exposed overseas, coming back and saying, "I'll make this my home." So, so we are proud to have him. And Sampath, as you know, is on our general committee as well. So we do a lot of work. But uh, Professor Sampath, currently a research scientist, specialized in Molecular ecology, ecology, uh, evolutionary genetics, and ornithology, right? So Sampath uses a lot of field-based work, and um, some of you may know he has set up a couple of labs. Uh, he has three labs: that's one in Belhuloya, one in Singharaja, and one in Mana. But uh, Sampath, in his own right, other than of course being uh, attached to the University of Colombo. Uh, he's a, you know, the our equivalent, I would say, of a five-star general, right? You know, he has discovered five species. That's not easy. Discovering one is bad enough, right? So he has two birds, a snake, and uh, two insects, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, we are really privileged to have someone like Sampath because Sampath is meshing the most modern styles technologies, DNA, and all of that into the whole area of studying bird life in Sri Lanka. So this is a much needed infusion for the country. And um, this is something that, you know, uh, my, my time in technology taught me that the smartest guys are the younger crowd who are closer to the technology. And so it's nice to see a young prof bringing all of that and nurturing the younger kids. I know he has a number of uh, research students under him, both from Colombo and other locations. So Sampath is very passionate about MANA. I know that because I've spent time in MANA on the field with him. And while he has many loves, I certainly know MANA is one of them. So Sampath excites us with this magic of MANA. And uh, I, am, I, I, I chose to not uh, run through the presentation because I want to excite myself as well. So ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Sampath. <laughs> Professor Sampath, I should say. And uh, we take it for granted because we're fortunate to have him on our committee. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the audience, uh, Dr. Pratia Goda, the opposition leader, and uh, yeah. Am I am I good now? Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the for coming here. It's a very rainy and wet uh, evenings, and uh, we are I think still uh, kind of uh, leave, uh, still we are in the comforts of the Zoom and the online technologies. Uh, thank you for coming, the opposition leader and the, uh, Dr. Petia Goda and uh, the likes. Uh, yeah, I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk about, uh, uh, I've done, uh, I think, a world record of uh, getting about 30 slides in the last uh, half an hour. Uh, so if you see anything uh, small uh, here and there issues, uh, please uh, uh, forgive me for that. But uh, uh, this, I'm, I'm only the spokesperson here. Uh, there's an army of people. Uh, one of our main funders, uh, Mr. Nyanam and his family is here. Thank you for that. And, uh, and also we have a local uh, team of uh, researchers, uh, conservationists, uh, who truly put uh, their uh, spare time, sometimes their main time there, and uh, uh, their spare time goes for their actual uh, jobs. Uh, and then we have uh, uh, our counterparts in India, uh, in the Europe, in North America, in the UK, uh, and in Australia. We are, and then the locals in MENA, uh, local grassroots organizations like Rebecca and uh, like uh, my students, uh, molecular biology students, the immunology students, the zoology, and then the sometimes environment science students. So, so, so I'm just a, a spokesperson of uh, many, many hours of uh, quality work uh, that these people put on. And, uh, and I have to uh, stress that uh, these partnerships actually uh, uh, produce some of the stuff that uh, we try to do. We try to uh, do paradigm shift uh, kind of stuff. We want it. I'm, I'm, I normally I don't want to do the same same old stuff. Uh, I never done it that way. So I wanted to change the paradigms of uh, of birding and ornithology. And uh, so that was the essence. And uh, but we went into a, a place and places, and we met uh, people that are much deeper need help need attention and uh, this is a bit of that uh, so talking about uh, uh, the today's topic i will talk about mana a little bit and our research and try to put uh, sri lanka in the world map in a slightly different way actually we are the pioneers in south asia and also good part of uh, asia Sri Lanka is the first in this particular thing that I'm talking about today. So now there are other countries, bigger nations like India and uh, bigger, richer nations uh, uh, picking these up. But we were the first uh, in the region. So we started, uh, uh, thanks to some of the support provided by our, our funders uh, at MENA, we have a small station called Sandpiper House. And, uh, and with there and with the support, we were studying the sand dunes, the mud flats, the, the history as well as birds. Uh, coming into it, just to give a little bit, three slides of just a basic uh, theory about why wetlands, why MENA. 40% of all species in this planet lives in wetlands. And uh, that is a lot. Uh, the planet is rich, about 10 million species of that 40% lives in the wetlands. Uh, over a billion people make their living from wetlands. A uh, billion people of seven billion planet. Uh, the, the net worth uh, calculated in 2010 is US dollars 50 trillion annually uh, coming from wetlands. And uh, remember, uh, paddy fields are wetlands as well. So wetlands are rich. Wetlands are very important economically uh, as well as environmentally. Most importantly, the fish, rice, seaweed are coming from one way or another from wetlands, shallow waters, coral reefs, uh, lagoons, uh, mangroves are the ones that actually provide uh, the main protein source of this planet. And in that light, Pog Bay, where the northwestern uh, sea border of Sri Lanka, where Mana is the southern shore, is uh, our richest uh, fish stocks. Uh, wetlands are very important, like Colombo is uh, one of the few Ramsar cities in the planet, 
uh, and the wetlands are very important for well-being. We know that all the jogging track stories and all this uh, dredging and uh, making it like exposed water bodies, that all came from this idea of well-being. Talking about well-being, this is a clip uh, that I got uh, last week, actually this week, sun, uh, Monday morning. Uh, this is, this is Mena. This is one Kale Ramsa. Ramsa site, one of the main, uh, very important wetlands in Asia. I try to convince you over the next uh, 40 minutes, uh, we are a global hub. Uh, this is Mena, uh, the, the island that jutting out from the northwestern shore, uh, a sandy, a low-lying island about 40 kilometers uh, long and about 5 to 7 kilometers wide. Uh, it has a lot of history, but in this particular context, uh, it, this is in the winter from October to March. There's about estimated 1 million birds uh, of about 120 species uh, can be seen there. Now, some of the iconic flamingos, uh, one of the most important, most uh, sought after birds like uh, spoonbill sandpiper uh, and uh, a host of uh, endemic species can be seen there. Uh, in the breeding season, in the non winter months, in, uh, from May to September, still Mena is teeming with life. Mena is teeming with young birds, maturing winter migrants, doesn't, don't want to leave into their Arctic or Northern uh, areas. They, they kind of mature another year or two in Mena. So they are there in Mena as well as host of breeding birds. Uh, Mena, like this particular area is very important because as you can see, the world has major flyways. These are called major flyways in a second i'll get the i'll get the laser pointer right so these are called major flyways it's about eight major flyways global flyways where uh, like billions of birds fly every year in the spring uh, towards north and in the some uh, autumn towards south uh, in these uh, general areas and of that Sri Lanka falls into this Central Asian flyway and Sri Lanka is the southernmost point of it. Uh, and uh, because of that, uh, we are in a special place. And uh, when you look at the Central Asian flyway, uh, it spans uh, in the west uh, from Europe to uh, Arctic in the north to uh, all the way to uh, the far eastern Russia and maybe into Alaska in the east and then uh, uh, down uh, to Sri Lanka. So it's a big triangle about uh, covering nearly about one fifth to two, uh, uh, like uh, one at almost one third of the, uh, the, 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 the Eurasia in it and, uh, and uh, consisted of about 30 countries. Uh, you can study 
migrants in many ways. Conventional ways includes, uh, uh, you know, birders go and record them, uh, count them, uh, study them. Uh, eBird is a very good tool if used wisely and effectively. Uh, migrant watch, another option, uh, as, as well as you can catch them and tag them. And then you can study specific locations where they go, what they do, and uh, and then where they uh, spend, uh, you know, in the winter, in the summer, how, how they move from point A to B and so on. There are specific training uh, permits and other clearance needed, but uh, I'm going to show you some of the, some of the stuff. And uh, in the second aspect, uh, catching them and putting a uh, specific equipment on them uh, normally starts this way. You have to first study the location and then you have to go into the, in this case, mud flat onto the water into the high, in, this is in the high tide. You go about a kilometer. Uh, these are students from the University of Colombo, uh, University of Rajarata, Peradeniya, uh, Sabaragama, Ruhuna, uh, also joined time to time. This particular case, these are the immunology and molecular biology students of the Colombo University. So you go into the mud flat and set up these special nets. And these nets will uh, catch them, the birds. These are the birds now in sacks. This is the safest way of doing it. They are very specific about 200 year old science behind this. Uh, if you know how to do it, if you have the training, it is very safe. And then you can study the molt. Uh, you can ring them and then you can measure them. And then you can enter data and it is more like a, a health check. And also you can get uh, specific blood or uh, uh, fat or some other protein or whatever uh, other samples uh, for later analysis. And this is a small kind of a clip that uh, from Colombo that summarizes uh, what we do. One of my tech savvy students uh, done this. always release them in the same site after about 10 minutes or so uh, but more modern that is the old-fashioned way except the blood sampling uh, the more modern way is you can put a, a specific uh, colored flag uh, each country has its own kind of a combination Sri Lanka is green green like green two green uh, uh, plastic uh, flags anywhere in the world if it is in the in the two green flags in the uh, right leg uh, that is Sri Lanka it's like a serial number of a uh, number plate of a vehicle so the advantage of this is the, the, the de development of the digital photography uh, you don't have to catch a bird now when you put the tag then after uh, photographers wildlife photographers can uh, take photos and identify the uh, the number and the number is uniquely placed so that it, they can ident uh, identify the origin of the bird uh, this is, for example, a uh, few years ago, uh, a photographer and a birder, Divan Biswas, had uh, noticed this bird in Mena, and that was actually tagged in Shanghai in uh, six years ago. Uh, never seen before, after the tagging, and it appeared in Mena after uh, six years, in 2020. So, so from that bird, we know that at least a bird that was tagged north of Shanghai is uh, f uh, had flown to Mena. And this bird is a globally threatened uh, species called great knot. Uh, satellite tagging it is the, the, the cutting edge or the most sophisticated form of uh, this uh, business of studying. There are many ways, uh, but uh, if you do it right, you can get a lot of information. Uh, there are different types of tags, very simple ones where you use antenna and try to locate like people do for uh, elephants and leopards to slightly advanced ones where you use a, a radio tag and uh, you can try, uh, uh, you can uh, use uh, like a mobile device and to follow these animals for mammals most people do that uh, the battery is heavy uh, but uh, for the birds the weight has to be less than three percent of the body weight 
so it is uh, challenging so you can't have a long like a bigger battery with a lot of power in it so the solution is to go with more advanced systems where you use a uh, gps technology plus a, a solar panel where you only have a battery to last a night during daytime the solar energy has to charge the battery and when you do that uh, you can get a like a very expensive small computer basically uh, and uh, it's very powerful these technologies can give you the elevation the speed also it can give you the uh, the behavior whether it's feeding or resting as well as climate windows the humidity the temperature the wind for, wind speed and uh, some of the tags that we started using uh, this month onwards has depth, per depth perception where we can study the, uh, the, the birds that are f uh, diving underwater, how deep that they dive, the temperature, the pressure, and so on. So it's quite, uh, quite powerful. I'll show you a small clip that shows the power. These are, these, this particular, uh, the, uh, the clip that I'm going to show you are European honey buzzards They're from Europe. It's a male and a female uh, from a nest being uh, satellite tagged, and they were flying to south through uh, Gibraltar, uh, uh, Spain, into uh, south uh, northwestern Africa, down to Namibia. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Before that, so these are different types of tags. The top one is the uh, is the solar panel. The size varies with the bird and the species and the type of uh, the nature of the species. There are one antenna, two antenna kind of different methods. But anyway, the, the rule is it has to be less than 3% of the body weight of the bird. So this is that European honey buzzards. The blue color is the male. The purple pink one is the female. So now they are about to move. This is Europe. Now the male has started migrating and the female is kind of following and now the female takes the lead and they are in now uh, Iberian Peninsula, they will soon cross uh, Gibraltar. Now, uh, now they move to Africa and they are coming back in the fall, spring. Uh, uh, satellite technologies. What we are using is slightly even the next level where we don't have that much money to uh, uh, subscribe a satellite. So we use uh, GSM GP GPS GSM systems where we use the existing um, uh, cell phone systems uh, to communicate with the satellite. So we don't have, we are only paying the cell phone subscription. Uh, not paying the the satellite subscription. Uh, the, there are advantages of doing it. It's it's good for countries like Sri Lanka. Uh, it, there are limitations as well, uh, because sometimes different countries have some uh, restrictions. So we have to wait uh, the the bird to pass that and so on. These are some of the storytellers that I'm going to tell you several stories. Uh, in fact, about 40 species of that, about 20 uh, individuals had uh, uh, told us interesting stories of 11 species. Uh, that includes uh, this is the Donald, uh, the Vijan, the Manike, uh, Huglin gull, uh, this is Himakumari, a uh, brown headed gull, uh, 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 Shavala, Northern Shavala. Uh, and then we put a, a resident spoonbill in uh, Boondala to understand the movement between Boondala and the Jason uh, protected areas. A cur Eurasian curlew, this is Gulsari. We haven't named every single bird, we've named some of the important ones that, uh, that actually produces very interesting stories and so on. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll tell the stories what they've told us. One of the stories, this is Gulsari. Gulsari is actually a uh, 
Kyrgyzstan uh, Stani uh, uh, writer had uh, this uh, story about uh, a relationship, uh, a friendship between a, a horse and, a, and, the, and his master. So Gulsari and Donald, uh, two uh, a pair of uh, visions that we caught in uh, Wankale. So they spend uh, the night in uh, Erukalampidi Inlet. Daytime, they come in the morning around six o'clock into Wankale. And uh, one call, inner one call, upon people know uh, photographers love that spot where the, the avasatsa uh, normally uh, come. They come there and then feed, and then they go to Viditalati Reserve, and then back to uh, Korakulam, which is a freshwater lake, and then back to, uh, to the, uh, their night roost at night. So this is so consistent, as you can see, they maintain that triangle. And the critical thing is all these places are protected places by the wildlife and nature protection, sorry, wildlife department. And, uh, but all these places are severely threatened by uh, illegal encroachment and some other problems, which I can I'll tell you later. But with this first time, we can we know what these birds do at night, what they do in the morning, and so on. This is, uh, we call it Kira. It's a crab plover, very uh, charismatic species, uh, the panda of the, the bird world, black and white, uh, a unique species coming from Arabian, uh, sorry, from uh, Arabian Peninsula in the Middle East, and uh, spend the summer uh, spend the winter here. And the, uh, this is uh, Urumalay and uh, Adams Bridge, we call them Rama's Bridge, uh, Rama's Bridge area, and then they fly back and forth to Wankali, sometimes to Iranatiu. Iranatiu is very important, I'll mention this name several times over the next half an hour. And this, they go back and forth and uh, utilize the, the mana and the northern landscape. So what happened when you put all these 22 individuals that I was talking about in manner of 11 species into one picture. This is what you see. This is just 22 birds of estimated 1 million individuals of 11 species of 120 species, a subset, a tiny fraction of birds and their movement within a year. These are not me telling because some might not believe me even though I'm a birder, I'm a scientist, and I spend a lot of time in Manar. Every month, my students spend a couple of weeks. I spend at least a weekend in Manar. People might or might not believe me, but this is unbiased uh, information produced by an inanimate uh, small pulse generated by a, a small electronic device, more like a computer. So this is unbiased information of the movement and utilization of this island of Mana and the Rama's bridge and the Rames, the Banushkodi, the South India, and our connection with the Pork Bay and the rest of the world. So that is one of the stories. Like slightly a kind of zoomed out uh, story. This is Ali. Ali, again, probably must have bred in uh, Middle East came to Sri Lanka, it flew around uh, the Arabian uh, Sea uh, through probably pa uh, Iran, Pakistan, Gujarat, Ram Ra Rajasthan, Gujarat, uh, down to Mana. And then Ali spent uh, most of the time in the Northern Peninsula. And then flew one night around 10 o'clock, it decided to fly to Batikalo. It flew directly 300 kilometers to Batikalo sorry, not 300 kilometers, sorry, plus 150 kilometers to Batikalo, spent about a week, went to Ampare, spent another few days, and then flew straight to Kahandamodara, salt pans, and uh, spent about a uh, few months and, uh, sorry, a few weeks and left. So Ali is one example. We have uh, birds flying to Puttalam, Kalpitiya, to uh, India, especially the, uh, Point Kalima, one of the main important areas, uh, Jaffna and so on around the Pog Bay. Talking about crab plovers, uh, they, are, uh, they are very charismatic. They are the only uh, burrowing uh, showbird in the planet. They are 
the only member of their uh, family. So it's, it's a very important bird, uh, but it has a very weird uh, distribution where it breeds in the tropics and overwinter in the tropics. So it goes horizontally along the tropics as a migrant. It's, it's not breeding in Sri Lanka, there's no records. And uh, we had this, uh, this uh, bird we called, uh, we had about five uh, tagged birds in uh, this Pork Bay area, and this is their movements. As you can see, they heavily use the southern Sri Lankan side of the of the of the Pork Bay, uh, Mana Island, uh, uh, sometimes into Jaffna Islands. Iranativu is the hub. They always use Iranativu as a transit point to Punakari and beyond, and uh, they used uh, this landscape a lot. This one is called Raja. Raja is a, it's a, it's a very special bird. It's something that we are, I'm going to kind of spill out a very brand new, like a new info, set of information that we found a few months ago. Raja, uh, we caught in, uh, in Mana, and then it spent uh, the winter in the, uh, in, the, in the Sri Lankan side. And in the summer, it went to uh, uh, Ra Rameswaram, and then to Point Calima. And it spent the summer, the breeding season, in uh, this area in Point Calima, which is a protected area. We have our collaborators working. Uh, my PhD student, uh, one of her uh, co supervisors, is actually a scientist in the Indian side. So we have very good connections with them. So, but we knew where it was, but we didn't know what it was doing. And uh, in August, it came with a with a baby, uh, a subadult, and uh, so we were. Gaimini was really excited, and she was uh, running through all the all the, the the servers and try to get the data back data to see where it was exactly. And then our collaborators went, uh, did some boating trips, uh, and eventually nailed down the general area and the specific locations that it was. And uh, we think that they, it bred there. But uh, because of the tidal variations, we couldn't exactly locate the, the burrow. But if, if further studies are needed, if this is the case, uh, if it is breeding, this is the first time this bird bred uh, outside uh, the recorded record, first record of it outside the Arabian Peninsula. So we are quite excited and we'll be busy next few months uh, with the, this uh, family group. This is how it, their nest would look like. Another story. Uh, one of my um, of the stories, this is the one that I really like about the uh, Larus fuscus group, uh, specific uh, gulls. Uh, these are very large gulls, the largest of the gulls that we get. Uh, and uh, Sri Lankan ones are either coming from these populations up all the way to Arctic, but nobody ever studied their movement before. So this is uh, one of our like favorite ones. This is Manike on my lap. This is my uh, PhD student. Uh, this is this PhD student working with uh, bat coronaviruses. This one is the one that the co-discoverer of the one of the new species of birds. And uh, Vimukti is in the audience. He, he works with uh, uh, woodpeckers. And then uh, Janani just left uh, to uh, fi finish her work on sponges in Sri Lanka. And now he's, she's in uh, the USA. So, and these are the flags. So this is. Kind of our team and you can see that i am not even holding this but these are nasty ones the gulls you know by default they are nasty beasts uh, they're very aggressive they are much more aggressive than an eagle of their, their size but uh, you know handling animals is an art it's more for art than a, than a science uh, when you are a master of it uh, you know i had animals coming to me and you know it's it's a very very it's a, it's a privilege i think and it's also a power and a, and, and a curse because you have to talk about them because they can't speak right so this is about manike the the first one uh, uh, manike is the first confirmed record of a bird from sri lanka uh, went to european arctic we know that birds do that but this is the first confirmed case also manike holds the first record of a bird that actually done the complete migration cycle from europe to sri lanka and back uh, from sri lanka to europe and back and it in that process, it uh, flew 19,360 kilometers in its first uh, trip. And the trip lasted from Mana to, through, uh, to uh, Eastern India, across Kaveri River to Western India, 
along uh, all the way to Gujarat, and then uh, Pakistan, uh, Kandahar, Afghanistan, uh, Kazakh Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, to Russia, and then to Europe, it crosses Alps, and then uh, to uh, Yamal Peninsula, the northernmost point that it could fly. The thing is that this is about 8,000 kilometers of continent. These are seabirds. We think that they would not survive a day in, in land, but they fly months in the, in the heart of a continent where none of us would normally travel. Uh, so, so, and then on the way, it came all the way down to uh, Afghanistan. And that time is the time where Afghan war started uh, in 2020. And it diverted, we don't know the reasons, uh, and went into Iran and used Iran, Iranian Pakistani border all the way to Arabian Sea and then uh, went to Karachi, spent a week in Karachi and came back to Sri Lanka. And uh, with Manike, we tagged another one we call Mega. Manike is because of the famous Manike song. Mega is the Mega Nada, the, the son of uh, Ravana. So, we try to use a assortment of Sri Lankan, Sinhala, Sri Lankan, Tamil, uh, Sanskrit, uh, English, all kinds of, and then Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, all kinds of names. So to reflect the, the true, true authors of these lands. Uh, anyway, so the Mega uh, did the same. Surprisingly, it, it slightly diverted back and forth, but it done the same. And uh, we love Mega. It's uh, completed its second complete cycle. And day before yesterday, it came Sri Lanka. It, it bred the second time in Yamal Peninsula and uh, uh, came uh, day before yesterday back to Sri Lanka. So, so it, it, in, it gave much more information and it is slightly longer journey than uh, Manike. And in the process, it connects these reindeer herders in the north with our humble fishermen of the our north. Uh, it connects uh, the sophisticated cold ocean uh, fish in the north, uh, in the Arctic, and our humble uh, fish in our north. And uh, so these communities are very different human communities, and they all would seek these birds as a food item, and uh, they all very different in their ways, their languages, but these birds connect uh, a small dot in the tropics with a, with a, with a dot in the Arctic. Uh, Mary, after the St. Mary's Church of Talaymana, Mary uh, we caught last year, uh, sorry, this year, early this year, and uh, it went into north and we are waiting for it to return. It also used the same, same route. Uh, these gulls, the northern route, you can see they fly straight up. And in the southern route, they tilt their movement a little bit towards westward, probably because of the rotation of the globe. They are so long distance. You're talking about, about 10,000 kilometers in one stretch uh, in a span of about a month. So they can actually sense the curvature and the rotational speed of the, of the, of the globe. So these are amazing uh, information and being a, a kind of a, a country that, uh, that wanted to develop human capital uh, knowledge as a knowledge hub, these are important new findings, uh, uh, global findings. And uh, we have our local uh, birders, uh, Lahiru, for example, uh, uh, the, the CEO of the NACDA uh, uh, sea urchin farm, uh, avid birder and a photographer and a very keen uh, uh, biologist or birder. And he managed to spot Manike uh, in, uh, in September, just uh, in November, just after it arrives. Uh, also, he photographed it uh, with the tag. And uh, in this process, these Huglin girls uh, crossed two continents nine countries and 25 cities. Since they are girls, they love cities. They went into one garbage dump to another, to another, to another. Another story. Uh, this one is uh, a kind of a global first because uh, uh, our very lightweight, small Cessnas actually done something Boeing uh, 747 would do. Uh, these gulls, the brown-headed gulls overwintering in Talemana, in Pesale, actually 
would have the can have can cross uh, the tallest peaks of the planet, where very few species could do. Uh, this is Himakumari. It uh, it uh, we caught in 2021 and it crossed uh, Himalayas in 18,000 foot altitude. And this is the first time uh, a brown headed gull been uh, uh, done that. And this is the third, uh, fourth, uh, sorry, third recorded instance then of a, of a bird uh, crossing Himalayas in that altitude. But the thing is that this is about four times lighter than the lightest bird that is recorded doing that. As I said, all the Boeing 747 type uh, heavy birds, a uh, few species were able to do that, but this is a, a Cessna in that light. What it does, it went into Tibetan plateaus, plateau and uh, bred and came back. Uh, this is Sherpa Tensing. Last year, it crossed uh, about 20 kilometers away from Mount Everest. Uh, the same week where Norgay Tenzin and uh, uh, Edmund Hillary uh, climbed that peak uh, uh, 69 years ago. Uh, so we to 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 honor the the great uh, explorers, the uh, the uh, Edmund Hillary and uh, uh, Tenzin Norgay, we uh, named him uh, Sherpa Tenzin. Uh, it uh, uh, went uh, further up into the uh, ever, uh, uh, Himalayas and went into Tibet. Uh, these are the two uh, routes. You can see the surprising similarities, but uh, the crossing uh, locations were different. Uh, the Sherpa Tenzing is a young bird. Uh, Himakumari is a much older bird. So I think Himakumari is old enough to understood uh, the actual uh, geology, uh, the landscape. So it uses a shallower, sorry, uh, more uh, like low altitude valley uh, to cross the Himalayas than the young energetic uh, uh, bird. It crossed the, the tallest possible point to cross the, cross the Himalayas. But anyway, they done that in amazing four, four and a half days. This bird done it from Mana to Tibet. It took only four and a half days uh, to cross uh, an altitude of uh, uh, from sea level in Mana to 24,000 feet uh, in, uh, in uh, Himalayas. And this is the two routes. You can see that they navigate through these valleys and uh, our technology is providing uh, great insights. Uh, and, uh, and I have to tell that uh, these technologies can be used for military uh, navigational uh, as navigational aid, uh, Sri Lanka military, uh, Sri Lankan uh, Air Force is uh, getting our assistance to uh, plot their uh, local uh, flight movements. Civil Aviation Authority uh, are getting our help uh, to plot uh, civil airlines to avoid uh, uh, bird strikes in, uh, in places like uh, Ratmalana, Matala, Katunayaka, and to avoid uh, damage to their, their crafts and lives, as well as uh, to uh, prevent unwanted uh, environmental uh, effects. Uh, so, so these are not just uh, theory and science and uh, like a kind of a weirdo birder wanted to do something different than other birders. These are actually can be used and can save lives. A small bird can knock down a plane. Uh, as I mentioned, these are those uh, bigger guys, about two to three kilo categories versus ours uh, is 500 grams, much smaller. But they, they all bred in, the, in this uh, high altitude plateaus in uh, Tibet. Uh, this is how they look like in Pesal. If you go in uh, in the winter months, in like now, if you go another month is better. And if you go to the Madala, when the Madala comes around 10 o'clock, this is what you see. I have a small, small camera. I half of the time I use my uh, cell phone and uh, you can get kind of something like that. Uh, so, but you never think that these guys would fly 24,000 feet altitudes in Himalayas and breed there. Uh, again, our, our friend Lahiru managed to uh, photograph our bird on air with the flag. And so we know that they are alive and uh, doing well. This is Vayu, uh, our only uh, long distance show bird that we managed to uh, uh, you know, record. Uh, it, it, it does something strange. It flew kind of wrong direction towards east 
and it tried to cross Himalayas four times and the fourth attempt it manages to cross and it enter into this the dry uh, northern uh, high altitude desert, the, the second uh, driest uh, uh, sandy uh, desert in the planet and it flew about 500 kilometers across that desert and went into Kazakhstan and in eventually uh, going the same route where our Hyuglin skulls did. And Vayu is uh, now in the north. We hope that it will come back. It's a gray plover, uh, very pretty bird. Uh, Gulsari, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it didn't, uh, uh, it spent most of the time in Mana and then went into uh, Jaffna and into uh, Tamil Nadu to uh, Andhra Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, Uttar Pradesh, then Agra, New Delhi, Haryana, and eventually it, it uh, settled in the Pong Dam uh, uh, sanctuary in Himachal Pradesh, spent the uh, summer there, and, uh, and we lost the signal in uh, early winter. And then uh, in the next spring, we got the signal as a dead dead bird signal the, when the, 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 the these devices can detect when a bird is dead so we communicate to the indian forest service indian forest service is extremely extremely capable uh, bunch of people so they manage to locate the using our coordinates they manage to uh, locate our tag and the carcass after six months and uh, they send the tag back to us uh, so anyway, so so it's a sad end uh, uh, of Gulsari after about a year, but uh, we managed to get uh, very important uh, overwind, uh, sorry, uh, stopover sites along the Indian Peninsula uh, with the help of Indian Forest Service and us. Uh, so this is what the Central Asian Flyway. It's a least studied, poorly understood, completely landlocked uh, uh, flyway. And uh, now with uh, over the past three, four years of our work, now we have a fairly good understanding in a Sri Lankan standpoint. Uh, also, we know now, Sri Lanka is truly a biological, uh, global biological hub, where we have uh, records of uh, birds coming from uh, Madagascar, Madagascar to us, Australia to us, uh, Southeast Asia to us, and then all the stories that I told and uh, starting uh, last month uh, even a uh, southern antarctic to here so it's a truly a hub and this hub this cradle is in peril it's in a bad shape this is a kind of summary of what i am going to tell you in the next few sec minutes uh, you can see the towering uh, wind farms you can see a lot of movement of movements of birds and wind farms you can see uh, a, like a ceremonial suicide of uh, some uh, uh, raptors you can see a lot of dogs you can see people under stress protesting you can see animals who can't go into land and uh, if you go to the other side and take a photo you will see uh, animals that couldn't go get into the water as i showed you earlier this is the uh, a fraction 22 individuals of probably 1 million birds uh, that moved in mana and that is this, uh, I don't know the, yeah, I think this, this particular projection is better than that one. You can see the, the wind towers uh, along the southern border. You can see lots of movement. Uh, and, uh, and this is a Ramsar site, globally important wetland. This is a uh, nature reserve, again, one of the most important uh, wetlands in Sri Lanka. And this is Rama's Bridge. Uh, iconic uh, location in the not just in Sri Lanka of the South Indian uh, region and uh, there's many more towers are planned uh, another series of towers are planned uh, uh, along the northern face now uh, the scoping meeting had happened last about three four days ago uh, I hope that uh, these things and then the government officials are extremely uh, stressed and unhappy and actually one uh, very senior official said that uh, they are going to put us a gun in my head and get my signature uh, and I said can you do anything uh, yes I didn't say who he, he or she uh, but uh, that uh, top officials officials said that uh, can I do anything about it uh, anyway that was a, with a kind of a sarcastic smile and uh, the locals are extremely stressed right now 
and uh, and there's plans for more towers here plans for more towers in the north uh, and what did happen uh, the more turbines what we see from the turbines right now is is a very heavy deforestation it's a clear cut even though the tower is a vertical uh, structure to get the tower in these are very long wings structures uh, you get a you need a clear cut and an access road and this access road now act as a dam in mena and flooding the entire uh, mena island and last year it was so severe that they have to uh, cut the tale mena uh, mena highway to get the water through the uh, because it act, it also act as a, uh, a, a dam and uh, we've seen lots of ex in, in, in intense uh, heightened poaching of spotted deer of uh, mana has uh, jungle cat fishing cat spotted deer as well as uh, uh, crocodiles and uh, uh, and then the uh, wild boar so we see lots of uh, very high heightened poaching because of these extra roads that has been now uh, exposed and then uh, encroachment uh, as well as uh, uh, the flooding as i mentioned garbage problems so these new uh, projects will bring more more trouble. Turb uh, turbines can be problematic for certain species. Uh, the vision is the problem because certain birds, they are specialized in soaring and scanning the ground, uh, would not see a, 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 a blade coming from the top. They, are, they have a blind spot in the top of their head. So that sort of species, especially large eagles and certain types of uh, Showbirds would find it, uh, they don't have the necessary tools to uh, avoid a, a coming oncoming uh, blade. A certain species are good at it, they can recognize it. Uh, it's, a, so it's, a, it's a vision related issue. And also the encounter related issues, how often they would pass this area and so on. Uh, this is the circle shows one of our tagged birds uh, right under the underneath these uh, towers. So if you do it, Right, right, these are green technologies. If you do it wrong, it, you might get a wasteland like this. These are all deforested, and uh, these are what we are talking about globally significant, nationally important, culturally very important uh, wetlands of very high productivity. Uh, Mena has supposed to be an underground power line, and this power line eventually become a above ground. And uh, these images taken by me over the past at least few months, can see that there are carcasses. I don't think these are intentional mass suicide attempts of these birds. And this is the power line. And the one justification of the uh, wind farms is that because the, the country had invested on this power line, and the, because of that, uh, uh, the full capacity of the power line has to be, uh, has to be used. Uh, but the power line is supposed to be going underground through the, the one Kali Ram society. Uh, encroachments. Uh, in a smaller scale, keeping these, uh, uh, the larger projects aside, the, the biggest problem in MENA to me is encroachment. Uh, no deeds, but uh, just you go and uh, fence uh, wherever you want, whether it's a freshwater body, a tank, vau taul, vau pitiya, vau bandeka, it doesn't matter, you just go and then you say that you are a supporter of that politician or this politician or uh, this priest or that priest. Uh, and then uh, the government official seems like uh, have no answer to that. Uh, this is an example of a, of a fence and you can see a, a spotted deer jumping this is a sequence over this this is over seven uh, foot fence and uh, th this is a male a well built male i happen to just got this series of shots uh, and i was just sitting uh, uh, in the midday uh, but a pregnant uh, spotted deer won't be able to do this a, a, a fawn or a, or a young deer would not be able to do this and uh, there are series of snares across uh, mana of all sizes uh, and uh, they'll do the, the dirty job later. So, so the fencing uh, encroachment is a, is a serious problem. Hunting is getting, I think, increasingly uh, severe now because of the more, uh, like more and more people uh, try to find uh, creative ways. Uh, there are lots of such uh, cases. Uh, 
and uh, dogs and cats. Uh, Mena is the, the has the largest breeding seabird colonies of Sri Lanka. Uh, about estimated about 30,000 pairs breed in Mena and uh, uh, adjoining islands. So it's a, it's a very significant breeding uh, ground for birds uh, besides the, the importance of migration. Uh, and these birds have no, in most cases, they have no uh, uh, biological, uh, they are not equipped to uh, deter a, a land predator, like a dog or a cat or a human. So, so they are, they, their only defense is just to fly away because this, like, uh, I don't know the projection here, these, all these dots are eggs of uh, like, about the size of a turkey egg. This is in one of the sand islands in the Ramas Bridge. So uh, a person who even don't pay attention might uh, step uh, hundreds of uh, eggs in a, in a one walk. Uh, a dog like this would destroy the entire colony and they get terrified and they will not come. We, we discovered uh, some of the news, uh, like several new species, actually one uh, all about, I'm waiting, I checked my phone uh, to get the final print. Uh, of the Hanuman plover, we have a, we, I'm waiting. Hopefully this week. I thought it might come last weekend. Uh, the final uh, final uh, paper out, but anyway, we are waiting. So the so so the new species, critically endangered species, like this is a list of uh, birds breeding in the uh, in the northern uh, Mana, and you can see eleven endangered species of that eight critically endangered species found in Mana, and so. Besides migration, it's a very important breeding center. Uh, the, one of the last slides, sand mining. I must say this, you know, the Australian uh, titanium sands uh, uh, once claimed that they got the right to uh, mine MANA 200 square kilometers. MANA had only 140 square kilometers anyway. So they got somehow 200 square kilometers. And then there was a public outcry in Sri Lanka. And then suddenly they uh, withdraw their uh, bid in Australia uh, because probably there are some some shady deals and uh, so they've done about over 3,000 cores. The mana, the problem with mana is it's a it's a um, on the salt water there's a freshwater aquifer, very large aquifer. If you disturb the surface, you disturb the freshwater. If you disturb the freshwater, mana most of the land plants that you see, coconut and uh, palmyra and other larger trees might not be able to survive. And uh, so any form of mining in MENA would be pretty, pretty bad. Any anyway, final few stories, sorry to kind of make it a kind of a kind of sad end, but uh, these are some of the positives. We are, may, uh, we are creating a green corridor with the help of government, uh, local NGO and uh, the private sector well wishers of MENA. This is MENA horses, by the way, in Korkulam, the large, the large and last uh, freshwater body in Mena. Uh, it's freshwater, so these these animals like donkeys, fishing cats, the jungle cats need this water, uh, and horses obviously. So we are creating a, a green belt. Uh, my my student Gaiwini and myself and Gaiwini is quite uh, kind of excited about this, and we've managed to get a land from the government, and we are building a corridor so that the horses and donkeys and other large animals can. Uh, go into the water uh, without uh, hindrance of these illegal encroachers and the fences. Uh, we started the blind, bird blind for photographers and uh, uh, like, uh, like birders. Uh, so to help, uh, you know, the community to understand the value of this, it's right next to the, close to the Man uh, the Korakulam Dam. And also we do uh, these programs, to, uh, kids programs uh, across MENA uh, called Guardians of Birds with the support of uh, uh, the well-wishers and our funders and uh, some of the bigger hoteliers in the, in the, in the, in the area. Uh, also, we set up a, a bird uh, club. Uh, again, uh, the students that, uh, uh, you know, work there to do their science, the satellite tagging. Gaiwini is the main researcher of the satellite tagging program, but she's 
she's very keen she's a keen birder and she wanted to have this club so that uh, the kids and the, the birders the visiting birders and uh, the lot of government and private uh, uh, you know uh, employers and uh, workers they are working there so they are if they are birders they can join the club and uh, do some birding and support the community and provide the, the riches of uh, such knowledge there this is some of the people that help uh, these activities and uh, with this i'll, uh, I'll take uh, 50, uh, 50 seconds of your time and uh, this is from the grizzly man uh, documentary uh, this is mana through its rail track uh, last weekend from Tale Mana in 550 8 o'clock you are Comanches are gone and the longhorns the outlaws are gone and the drovers the Alcantros are gone the Comanches are gone the outlaws are gone now Quattro is gone Stan Wapti is gone and the lion is gone and the red wolf is gone one morning they searched his adobe he disappeared without even a word But that night as the moon crossed the mountain One more coyote was heard If you love, if you love uh, Sri Lankan outdoors, enjoy that view. That's from Palaymana to uh, one Kali, that that uh, Palmara strand, that uh, wilderness will have numbered days. That is where the windmills will come the next phase, and that Palmara strand, strand will be clear cut. And we have people who can change that decision. The political power, the economic capacity, the pressure groups are here. So. That must be the last, last of the uh, uh, years that uh, those stretch of land would uh, see as it is. All right, thank you very much. Yeah, let's get the lights on and a couple of uh, questions going and we'll have the mic going round. Um, Sampat, one or two questions. So I think uh, one is really around the uh, ethics around the, and behavior around the photographers. And uh, so we'll start there. And, uh, you know, there have been a couple of comments and questions around, you know, the right way to go about photography and some of the behaviors that we've been seeing where people are, you know, getting very close to birds, etc. We had a uh, articles and things around drones we've had you know you know then there have been these uh, crackers and all, all all kinds of things so what do you think is going to play out and what can we do do to make that different yeah i think you, 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 you can uh, regarding the uh, the photographs i'm not a photographer so <laughs> I, I I decided not to carry a camera like uh, anything uh, other than a smaller kind of a zoom kind of a camera because I I'm I'm a I'm a naturalist I'm a painter I I am uh, I do many other things and I try not to distract because I think photography kind of has that kind of a uh, tomato catch up effect uh, you forget everything and you start uh, taking photos uh, so but I respect them and I think they are very important uh, ele element uh, because there's more photographers now than the, ever before. So, and they, they could spend that million or two million or three million uh, for something else. So they decided not to spend that on that money on that, but they are spending that in nature and they are appreciating and they are the agents and the messengers, I think, of the, of the wilderness. So I, 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 I respect them. Uh, actually, to be very honest, I, I don't experience this uh, mad rush because since I'm not a photographer and I normally don't go with the, the main crowds. I never go to Yala, I never go to uh, uh, Vasgamu, I always go to places where, you know, 
less people travel. So I normally don't experience that, but I can see in Mena and I can I see that in Horton, uh, in Singaraja, this mad rush. Uh, I, I, I don't mind, actually, to be very honest, but I think they do a greater good to this issue than, so we should not discourage, yes. We should be very careful, uh, uh, probably to educate uh, whatever uh, these few rogue uh, photographers, but I think uh, they do a greater job uh, service uh, in a broader sense. Yeah. Drones, again, uh, I love drone photography. Uh, I love trap camera photography, uh, but they, all these, I mean, it's like milk, you know, you, if you do it wrong and if you, if you do it, uh, like you know the wrong ways it, it can cause you trouble yeah the judges i think the most important one you need to educate because i need to fight for the my climate in Sujetna. and i am the only one fighting and now i have come to the supreme court so i think you need to educate the judges first not the schools judges the first one I agree. Uh, WNPS has uh, the legal subcommittee actually doing exactly that because there are good people who who understand and they are qualified lawyers. Uh, a team of uh, lawyers actually uh, uh, are doing exactly that. Very good point. And uh, I know other people in the wildlife department and in other department support. We also in our capacities help people. Yeah. 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 So I, I was trying to see if Revan was in the audience, but uh, we have been doing some uh, sessions for judges in the past, and I think that's ongoing at the moment. But it's a uh, well, yes, not to every last judge for sure, but uh, I, I think we'll get there at some point. But yes, good point. Thank you. Uh, there's a question there while I hand the mic here. Sampat, uh, thank you. Ah, yes. Thank you, Sampat, for that very interesting presentation. Uh, I take that these um, transmitters that you attach are on the back of the bird. Yes. How do you attach them? There is uh, there's again different methods. The method that we use are called backpacks. So it's a non-invasive method. We don't do surgeries, and uh, it has a uh, like a, a special thread uh, that normally used for parachutes. Uh, so it's a lightweight, ultra strong. Uh, thread that uh, basically we uh, we create make a uh, backpack and that yeah so that backpack goes on, not stuck on not stuck on but it stays between the feathers and the skin yes yeah. hi sampath i have two questions very quick ones uh, they say the aral sea was run dry by cotton cultivation in India, in the Rajasthan, that area altogether. Do you think that MENA has benefited from salination of the Aral Sea, uh, cotton cultivation, glaciers melting in Hindu Kush mountains and areas like that? Do you think that MENA is not the original uh, building ground, but they have come here because other areas are being degrading very fast? Uh... I'll answer it in two ways. Uh, cotton cultivation, I don't think has much effect because it's very recent. Uh, uh, Sri Lanka is very old, uh, at least about 150 to 200 million years old. Uh, and Mena, the pork base, not as old as that, but uh, somewhere around 40 million years and plus. So, and the, the sand banks are kind of a responding to uh, broader global uh, climatic changes like say about 15,000 to 30,000 year cycles. So MENA is completely uh, flooded about 15,000 years ago and uh, completely uh, a kind of a, a shrub forest uh, with a decent sized uh, uh, shrub uh, in another 15,000 years ago. So, so these uh, dynamics are there. You see them like over the past four years uh, we are we lost about three islands now we don't have the the so-called nine islands in the ramas bridge we have about six now because of the sea level rise so it's changing all stuff i'm just curious i have never been to mana but what is the most contiguous continuous uh, land area where we can lobby certain influential people to give in to uh, establishing a protected area. I mean, is it scattered, fragmented, or is it like, is there a huge area which can be uh, 
land like long. very interesting question mana has it's a it's a long uh, like a uh, boomerang like a shape island the either sides of the island is protected and in between there's good very good uh, habitat so it is important to connect those with uh, some protection which is needed as you suggested very correctly uh, the location i think uh, you can start from mana town Uh, no, no, it's not illegal. It's the due process had been followed. It's just issue is that uh, uh, the the right technology has to be used. Uh, the problem is the quality of wind. The why the mana is so lucrative is the quality of the wind. But that same quality wind can be found in Silavatura, Aripu, and the, in the mainland, which is much less risky in terms of ecological footprint why you like you know mana is not a wasteland it is a it's a global hub it earns a lot in through tourism it has a history culture communities series of communities living in it about 2000 communities living in it so it's not a dry barren land uh, so see so but you go to the mainland and mainland also has the same quality wind uh, so that's where uh, those are tactical, strategic uh, uh, things that need to be done. And there's a due process. That process has been followed actually. Uh, in previous occasions, I'm pretty sure it will follow this year. This time, the problem is when the right information goes in to make the right decisions. The, yeah, the problem is there are so many experts, quote and unquote, and they would say that they know this and that, and they see this and that. But that info, would that information strong enough to make a case against a multi-billion dollar project or to divert correctly, not, uh, not stopping it, but cor placing correctly in the right position, would that simple, uh, that I know kind of, attitude would that make that would that be able to make that decision correctly no that's a problem you need the right information in the right scale to deal with this sort of this sort of a large scale projects not to stop but to put waste in the right place so that minimum environment damage minimum societal damage uh, and minimum um, other economic losses uh, uh, happen when it is done Yes, uh, you mentioned about uh, Himakumari and yeah. Sherpa Tenzing crossing Himalayas. Yeah, uh, I would like to know whether if you have the information at hand, uh, how many stop you, you mentioned it was like within four days, yeah. but uh, within that period, how many stop pose and if possible, I'd like to know, especially whether there was a stop pose in the snow peaked areas it's an interesting question yes uh we have a very, fairly good understanding about the hugelin gulls for example where they stop and how they do and when they turn and when they not turn you know in the in a path uh for the hugelins they do very predictable each individual do the basically the same does the same thing in the two brown-headed gulls they in certain ways, they are similar. They flew, they spend about two, three weeks till about end of April in Mana. And then they go to all our, every single bird that we tagged and we get data, at least spend a day in Iranativ. Iranativ is the most important spot. In my opinion, we have data to support in the Northern birds for some reason. Uh, easy to protect it's under the strict control of uh, uh, sri lankan military so we've done some surveys and we try to get it uh, with the help of the, the government and the local communities to get it a, a strict nature reserve uh, so they stop in every single bird one way or another stopped in unity for some reason uh, whether it's a duck or a small bird to a large bird to a gull you name it uh, crab rovers to every single thing that we put a tag on at least spend a day before migration and after migration right you know in between it's a very important stop staging area and then they go to uh, either to jaffna peninsula or to point kalima normally speaking point kalima is the, the the jutting out point in the india in sri lanka and india 
and then uh, they fly and then they stage in large rivers like Mahanadi River, Brahmaputra, sorry, before Brahmaputra, the uh, Kaveri, a uh, Kaveri beforehand, and then Mahanadi, and then on top Ganga, and then uh, so they use large rivers as staging areas and then highways. So they use the, they follow the river, and they spend about a day to four days before the ascent, and then they ascend one go. They don't stop in the high peaks. Uh, the Sherpa Tensing took only four and a half days all, all the way from here to, to Mana to uh, Tibet. In the process, it went straight to uh, uh, the foothills of Himalayas, spent two days, and uh, within a half a day, it flew, uh, took the, the entire, entire dash, uh, spent a few hours, and then went all the way directly to Tibet. So it was very fast, but some birds spend a little bit long, and but they went like I think they visually see the tower, towering mountain, and then spend some time rest and they go. So those wetlands, uh, whether it's for shorebirds or whether it's seabirds or whether it's ducks or whether it's passerines, are so important because they fatten themselves, rest. They need clean water, they need insects or uh, food, and then they do that dash if you destroy those foot uh, low uh, foothills the, the these whatever these uh, wetlands uh, in the foothills you kill the population same true on the return journey like here like badagana the uh, saru park uh, the wetlands in the colombo district are so critical because the people the birds that fly that f do the final dash are like marathon runners after the crossing line you know they are strong, yes, they can do 10,000 kilometers, but they're so weak because they, through time, through thousands and thousands of years of time, they, they have that energy only to cross that last bit. And then they don't have energy because that is how they designed. You can't carry more, you know, payload when you are a flying machine. Any, any, any pilot would tell, right? any aer aer aeronautic engineer would tell you, right? So they have only that payload the, the bare minimum needed to do that journey. If not, you have to refuel on the way. So some animals do that, the, the gulls do that. They spend about a month to do that. Uh, like the larger gulls, the huglins, for example. So it's, it's a different ways. But these top oversights are so important for the survival of the species. More important sometimes than the wintering grounds and breeding grounds to maintain the species here. Uh, the fastest, the record ones flew about 1000 kilometers, uh, normally about 300 kilometers per day, per day. So it again depends on the species. Ducks fly faster, uh, large gulls can fly faster, uh, just simply because they are bigger machines. Small birds need time, yeah. But ours about 300, 400, about that much, right? Yeah, per, per, uh, per day. Yeah. So, but excellent talk i'm really impressed that's great science and um the conservation aspects well i wish you all the luck on that um, your point... long-term your long-term studies certainly helped uh, me to uh, design and uh, navigate through science thank you thank you so much <laughs> um in the six late late 50s or 60s there's a german scientist from the max Planck institute who did some experiments to show that the birds navigate at night time using the, the stars. My question then is, um, I suspect that these animals are, these birds, migratory birds are also doing the same thing. My question is, on overcast days, have you, okay, you have this excellent satellite tracking information. Do you find that, that the birds stop on overcast days? Is, is, there a, is there an impediment in their migratory route for overcast days? Yeah, our analysts should listen. Yeah, no, that's what we're gonna do. We wanted to know what they do because we have, we can get weather data. We know uh, exactly every two hours or so we get a data point. So we know uh, we know that we have the data, but we we haven't done the analysis. Tons of data, you as you can imagine. So those are the next steps. What, what goes into their head? 
uh, we don't know right, right now, but I, I hope that another maybe six months or a year from now, we'll be able to tell because they do interesting things. They follow, say, there's an Orb River. There's a river called Orb River flows from Kazakhstan to uh, actually the borders of Kazakhstan and Russia all the way to Arctic. So they follow the Orb River as a, like a flyway. And then they suddenly change and uh, cross the European border. Almost like a, like a, like a, like a, some sort of a uh, kind of a point where they have to take. And birds do that. So the question is, what's the clue that they know? Are they, is that a visual clue? Or is that something that they knew that they have to turn, say, another 50 kilometers from now? And uh, some, sometimes they, they have the option to either a rap, a very like a sharp turn or a slow turn, uh, you started to turn early. So we are interested in the, that sort of information. And also, as I mentioned, during the Afghan war, the, our birds started to go through Iran. Is that the sound or noise or visually, like whether had they seen the bombs or planes flying? Those are, but we have information. It's, it's interesting. I think we'll spend another good chunk of time, uh, especially my student will spend a lot of time on that. Both, yes. Yeah. Professor Sampat, yes. we're so proud of you okay. and your team and amazing work using cutting edge technology. We're so proud Thank that you. we have uh, sons and daughters like this in our nation. As you said, someone would put a gun to your head. We all would like to preserve, but the current uh, appointed leaders, not elected leaders, are so keen in developing or borrowing or begging, they would put everyone in a rehab camp if you try to stop their development. Any idea how we could uh, get through to the media or tell them how important it is because I think the leadership of the nation is more willing to beg at any cost. Who are not appointed, uh, ele elected by the people, but they are appointed. Yeah. So they want to make us beggars and destroy. Yeah. Any suggestions? Uh, I'll answer that in a, two different ways. One is that the real issues are, uh, yeah, I think political leadership, political uh, inability of uh, the leadership to lead uh, caused a lot of problems and stress, yes. So that is always a problem for environment, as she pointed out. It's an it's a, it's a ongoing battle throughout the history of this planet, I guess, uh, whenever the humans started to control. That, so that problem will be there. On top of that, it's a problem of information, information flow and lack of information. And then the decisions made based on information. The unfortunate reality of, say, Sri Lanka is we are not a data-driven nation. We are individual driven nation, icon driven nation. Any field you think you are, you try to make a, an icon or follow an icon. That icon can say anything and people, half of the, the country or a society or a community or a club would believe in that icon and the other half won't believe it. So, so the problem is that the, the, the knowledge, understanding and the value system of that icon basically drives the decision making process. So it's a, it's a problem on all levels. Uh, it's because we are not a data-driven nation. So that problem is a bigger problem as a, as a, as a scientist, I found. I'm pretty sure some of the scientists here would agree with me. Uh, so, and then the other problem is that, do we have the right set of information for these people to make that decision? Uh, that is another issue. So these are like three different levels. Uh, the sad reality is that environment, most cases uh, is in the losing side of it. Yes, uh, <clears throat> Sampat, thank you very much. Uh, we thought we knew something about Mana from our old experience, but today was a quantum jump. So thank you for that. I have just a small comment. One is that uh, wind farms have a life, 25 to 30 years, but after that. So there's a more serious thing because we have this illusion that uh, tourism is, is the end thing. And there is a proposal to build casinos in Mana, right? Now, to me, that's a serious thing, okay? And then they'll be killing the birds as to feed the fellows who come to the casinos. So this is going to be a major issue. So I think this information that you have has to get out fast. And 
distributed as much as possible internationally as well as in Sri Lanka so that you know our politicians don't use their heads no at least the general public will know what this is all about and support you in in your endeavor you know I think this is important because I mean tourism to me is one of the most dangerous things actually it destroys culture altogether and so on and all the studies done on tourism shows that after 15 years of tourists entering a site, the site gets destroyed. I, I don't go into that in this audience, but basically, I think the information that you have is unique. It has to get out and as fast as possible so that everybody knows something about it, you know, and, and, and so on. Now, now I'm glad that that Australian thing has been stopped temporarily. I mean, that should be banned completely, you know it will destroy the aquifers and everything will get destroyed completely so i think these are issues that maybe the wmps can pick up and and push in various directions but the information should come out i think as quickly as possible thank you very much it was an excellent presentation thank you thank you point well taken and i i might add a small thing uh, i believe that economic prosperity will solve some of the problems even though it is itself it can cause problems but uh, longer term, uh, through economic prosperity, we, we can start uh, putting certain standards on. Like now, the classic example, because we are now going in the you know in the rim. Uh, now you can't talk about the standards. So so econ getting economic prosperity or at least some economic stability, I think, is important. Uh, it, on top of what you said, yes, I agree. Yeah. Last, last, last question. Yeah. Example. Uh, I presume the Indian and Pakistani scientists uh, may be doing similar tracking stuff. And do you all share the information? And there must be a lot of corroboratory you know, evidence that can be made use of. Pakistan is a kind of a black box uh, for science for a while, at least biological sciences. Pakistan is very diverse, you know, from mountains to the coast to it's a, it's a kind of a very kind of black box anyway. So I don't know much. I'm pretty sure they haven't done much. We have good communications with India. We have very strong ties. We have ties, strong ties with China, and we have strong ties with uh, Kazakhstan, Russia, and Europe, and so on. So we are well connected. We were the first. Uh, <laughs> I thought that I think whatever Indian scientists thought that they cannot do that without the military clearance. Uh, it's a bigger institute, a bigger system, ours simpler, so we had that upper hand and we get got the support from the right people who are here as well. So, so all this helped uh, and uh, anyway, uh, but uh, Pakistan, no, I don't think they have any of this, uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it's connected, yes, you cannot do these sort of things are broader collaborations, yeah. Yeah, you see so many different logos, <laughs> just simply because different parties play different roles, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I will have to take you offline and uh, so you can catch some path of a nice cup of Dilma tea. Uh, sorry, but we, I know it's a thrilling question and, um, you know, session, but uh, everything has to come to an end. Just before that, again, to say thanks to NTB for supporting this lecture and uh, just before all of you go and some of you should know uh, next lecture it's going to be very interesting because we are flying somebody down and that's uh, dr tempe adams so she's currently the coexistence and education manager for elephants without borders and she works with you know uh, some of the areas in uh, botswana which have some of the highest uh, elephant populations and it's going to be a very very interesting session i think dilma is Dilma is uh, playing a role in uh, helping fund some of that to get them down. So it's going to be a cracker session uh, next month. And as you know, the um, uh, Human Elephant Conflict Subcommittee in Sri Lanka has been pioneering a, a lighting system, which we use to try to, uh, you know, navigate some of the elephant issues in uh, the rural areas. They have a similar project going on there, so it's going to be very interesting to see how we can compare notes. So don't miss next month's lecture. And on that note, 
let me invite one of our past presidents, Ravi. Ravi, if you don't mind stepping forward to hand over a small gift to Sampat. Sampat, if you don't mind doing the honors in front. Thank you again, Sampat, for that insightful lecture and for, you know, exciting all the future scientists with the potentials that technology and, you know, new ways of working have to offer in this country. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for Sampat for that very insightful lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Let's call it an evening. Wish you all the best and uh, see you hopefully in a month's time. Thank you. Good night.